Yeah, I'm Heather. Lovely to be with you um, this morning. Um, I work at the Christie. I've worked in the field of nuclear medicine, which is sounds terrifying, doesn't it? Let's be honest. Uh, we inject people with radioactive stuff and see where it goes. I'm not sure that's helping. Um, and I've worked in nuclear medicine for 20 years. I've been at the Christie uh, for about 18 months now. I'm a specialist in positron emission tomography which is what I'm going to introduce you to this morning. Now, you may be familiar with the idea of antimatter, that there is an opposite version of the stuff that we're all made up of. And there is an idea that appears in science fiction novels quite a lot, that you could meet your anti-self, and if you shook hands with them, you would disappear in a burst of energy. Well, that actually potentially could happen. Einstein, um, in the early 1900s, published a number of seminal papers, and one of them included the idea of energy mass equivalence. So this equation equals mc squared essentially tells us that energy and matter are two forms of the same thing. So if you were to squish, if you were to basically dissolve stuff, it would turn into energy. For those Trekkies amongst us, I think I'm fairly on fairly safe ground, presuming there will be some in the room, you will know that the warp core in the Starship Enterprise is uh, powered by such a mechanism, although how they actually keep the antimatter and matter separate is still a bit of a mystery to me. If you want to enlighten me over lunch, that'd be great. This process of pulling matter out of energy is actually why we're all here. At the beginning of the universe, we had a big bang, a big burst of energy, and somehow, out of all that, matter, stuff that makes up us, that makes up everything around us, emerged dominant over antimatter. We didn't just have equal amounts of matter and antimatter, and it all dissolved back into energy. Matter won out. And it's one of the big questions that's being asked at CERN at the moment, is why that was, why we don't have an antimatter universe, why we have a matter universe. So actually, they're looking at what happened right down here, right at the sort of part, just before the Big Bang kind of really exploded and the new universe began to take shape. This all sounds a bit abstract and a bit weird, and we're back in the distant past. So what, why am I talking about using antimatter emitters in hospitals? Well, it's because we can actually see this stuff in real life. Um, its existence was predicted by possibly the grumpiest physicist ever to have lived, Paul Dirac. Um, that's him smiling. It's not very convincing, is it, really? And uh, he came up with this spectacular equation, um, which I won't go into any depth about because basically I haven't touched it since first year of physics degree. And it basically tries to resolve electromagnetism and quantum theory. And it predicts the existence of the electron. So all the properties of the electron it predicts. But it also predicts uh, an opposite number to the electron. So something with equal mass, e uh, exactly opposite charge, and several other similar properties to the electron. So of course, when a theoretician like Dirac goes, there must be a thing, experimentalists go, we must find the thing. Um, and Carl Anderson got cracking, and a mere four years later, discovered the positron. So this is um, his experimental evidence. I've actually seen this photographic plate and I spent rather a lot of time in front of it. It was slightly embarrassing. It's kind of a, one of my first dates with my current partner and went to an exhibition at the Science Museum and it was almost like he'd stood me in front of the cathedral window. I was like gawping. In fact, he's still with me. It's a good sign, I think, after that experience. Um, so this is a, a, cloud, a cloud chamber um, a picture of a cloud chamber and cloud chambers work when particles pass through them and they leave like a condensation track through the cloud chamber. And if you put a magnetic field across a cloud chamber, a particle with a charge will bend in a certain direction and the, how much it bends depends on how heavy it is. And this bend here is exactly what you'd expect from an electron but the other way around. So if you had basically this bend going exactly the opposite way, that would be an electron. So this is a positron because it's behaving exactly the way, same way as an electron, but a mirror image. It's kind of like if you were Newton sitting under a tree, and instead of having an apple landing on your head, it kind of flew off somewhere in the opposite direction. That's the kind of effect we're kind of seeing here in this cloud chamber experiment. Anderson got the Nobel Prize for this in uh, 1936. I would love to say that this proves that if you want a Nobel Prize, you should be an experimental physicist like me, 
but the Higgs boson kind of disproved that theory. So where do we find this antimatter? Um, this is a, a table which adorns many science laboratories up and down the country, um, otherwise known as a Segray chart. You may have come across it under that name, where we call it Table of the Isotopes, because that's what it is. Um, each row is the same chemical element, and it has the same number of protons, so it has the same number of electrons, the chemistry is exactly the same, but a variable number of neutrons, making up all these different variants of carbon, for example, on that row. And the black ones in the middle are the stable elements. Now, what you need to know about isotopes is generally they just want a quiet life. They just want to sit there and be. They don't want to be doing all this radioactive decay nonsense. They want to get back to this line of stability. So either above the line, they've got too many protons. They'll try and convert a proton to a neutron and get back down to the line. Uh, that way, below the line, they've got slightly too many neutrons. So they try and convert a neutron to a proton to try to move upwards to that line of stability. And all of these ones, these are examples of some of uh, the positron emitting isotopes that we can use. So these ones decay by de converting a proton to a neutron, and it's got to do something with that positive charge. So it goes, um, I'll create a positive electron, that'll work, and chucks the positive electron out of the nucleus, and that's how we get a positron decay. So it's conserving charge, it has to have the same amount of charge before and after that interaction, and we get a positron generated in that particular form of decay for slightly proton-rich isotopes. You'll notice that these are quite handy. Carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine. These are the kind of atoms that occur in biological molecules, the kind of things that we're made up of. And you can stick these atoms in place of something that is naturally occurring. This is glucose. So instead of a hydrogen here, we can stick a fluorine on. And fluorine is quite a small atom, similar electron configuration on the outside to a hydrogen. That will behave exactly the same as a non-radioactive form of hydrogen. So this is fluorodeoxyglucose. It's one of the most common traces we use in um, positron emission tomography. So if you're coming for a scan using this particular type of tracer, we'd inject you with positron emitting sugar and watch where it goes. So you want to see how it accumulates in the very metabolically active areas of your body and use that as a measure of how active either disease or healthy tissue was in those particular parts. So we've basically got somebody who's emitting positrons after this injection. So how do we actually go about detecting those? And in order to demonstrate this, I have a small illustration at the front. Um, for this, I need someone with serious anger management issues. Has anyone had a bad summer? Home with the kids a bit too much? I'm going to pick on somebody if you don't volunteer. Bryn, do you want to go just grab someone? No, he's, he's, not, he's not going to sign up. Come on, come on. Bring some glamorous assistants. You need at least two glamorous assistants. So either friends or people you don't want to be friends with after this. Uh, it could go either way. <laughs> so let's pull this forward a tiny bit. We need, we need two people to assist. That's for later. You can do that later. I need Come you to on, do man. this bit first. <laughs> <laughs> so, just to, this was designed by a colleague of mine, Richard, uh, shortly before his retirement. There is a diagram available for if anyone should want to make one in the comfort of their own home. Um, so, it has ping pong ball guns on each end and a couple of little catches so that when you smack the doorknob in the middle, it basically releases the ping pong balls. Now, what do I mean by why, why the heck have I got ping pong balls and doorknobs and all this kind of stuff? Well, as you know, electrons are blue because when you pull a plug out the wall, all the electrons fall out and it's... No, that's okay. Um, so, electrons... This is exactly the kind of audience where this joke actually works. I love it. Um, is it electrons are blue, so obviously positrons are red. So we have Richard's gamma ray gun complemented by complemented by Heather's positron hammer. You will notice it's secured by gaffer tape because I gave it to a very angry physics teacher once and that didn't work out very well. Um, so if you could apply suitable force here without actually breaking it again, that would be lovely. Um, 
So a positron meets the electron, what happens? I'm going to need a couple of catchers. If you could stand here, that would be lovely. I'm going to stand well back. So no one plays for Hebden Bridge cricket team then, I can gather by that. Again, so, again. Again, again. <laughs> He's like... Okay, so let's reattach the catches. So if you just poke through the actual barrel of the gun, there's a little, there's a little rod there. Mm -hmm. uh -huh, okay. And then I put it on the catch for me. If you pull it, it can just kind of disengage a little bit. Okay. Okay, so we'll do it at a slightly different angle this time. So bear that in mind. Catches, please. Oh, in the hat. <laughs> oh, mate. <laughs> Too hard. Right, one more, one more, one more. All will become clear, by the way, if you just think I'm just playing with toys for lols up here. Um, I will explain what oh, I'm we're doing. Oh, we're not. Oh, Are we not? I ten thought. Minutes, ten minutes. Well, it's not a bad way to spend a Friday morning, is it? Let's be honest. Okay. Right, okay, off you go. Okay. Oh, okay. So. I can deduce from that that you're not particularly efficient um, radiation detectors, but apart from that, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much for your enthusiasm. <laughs> thank you very much. Have a seat there. So what was, what was all that about? Well, um, we have, in, the, uh, in current generation PET scanners, we have this big ring of detectors. So, um, hula hoop. Anyone heard this? Go on, Bryn. This is my youngest Bryn. You just want to hold that for me, just so we can see it. Could you hold it up for me? That'd be ace. So what we have is a big ring of these detectors, and the patient goes in the middle, as you'll see, as all physicists like to oversimplify things. Patients are always pink ellipses um, of uniform density. Um, so we have a radio, a radio, our radio isotope is decaying. It's emitting positrons. The positron runs into the electron um, somewhere inside the patient's body. Matter meets antimatter. The two cancel out in, in, in and give us energy. And we have the energy emerging from the patient as two 511 kV gamma rays in opposite directions. Now, the 511 kV is important because that's the amount of energy that you have bound up in one of these positrons or one of these electrons. Um, so that's kilo electron volts. It's a very tiny, tiny amount of energy, um, but it's enough to get out of the body and for us uh, to detect it. And these pairs of gamma rays, if we can be looking at our, our detector, this is where it would have been helpful to disentangle these before I started, but never mind. Um, let's see what we can do. There we go. So we've got a detector that's looking for these gamma ray pairs all the time. So if both we have two of these gamma rays arrive in a very small window of time. Thank you, Brian. So we have one detected at one side. We have another detected at the other side. We have, I'll collect that later. Okay, so if we have another one collected over here, and another one over there, and another one, the observant of you will notice that the ribbons coordinate beautifully with the colour of the ping pong balls. We have another one over here, another gamma ray detected there. So you can see if you did this over and over and over again, we'll just raise it up a tiny bit more, Bryn. Cheers. You see that those lines would tend to overlap most at the points which were sources of these positrons. So we collect all of these overlapping lines. We overlap them in what we call image reconstruction, which is basically a load of maths. And then we can build up this image of the distribution of where the positron came from. All right, thanks, son. How is, this, how is this actually done in practice? I mean, I think whoever decided let's inject people with radio, 
with, with, with anti-matter emitters deserves a large glass of champagne to start with. But um, how we actually do it is that it started in 1952 when you have something that looks like it came out of a B movie, maybe a horror B movie. We have these scintillation detectors that turn gamma radiation into lights on each side of the patient and you have a perspex grid and you just step them across this perspex grid and you have a chart recorder. Who remembers chart recorders? Oh, yeah, I, yeah I, I caught the tail end of chart recorders. Um, and you end up putting a darker mark where you've got a higher signal. So you end up creating this, you draw around the patient's head and you take measurements at all these different points and you say, well, we've got slightly more signal here. That means with this example, there's slightly more blood flow at this point. And that moved into a multi-detector system. So basically, you just added an array of these things so it was a bit quicker in the 60s. In 1968, we ended up with this. Ooh. This is the electronics. Those of you who have a, a laptop screen and keyboard attached to each other or not, um, will know that this is vastly less powerful than what you, you've probably got in your phone. But this is the electronics that was reading out all of these individual detectors. Um, and we could actually take step these, um, we call the gamma ray pairs as we rotated these detectors around. So you stick the patient's head in there and the body coming out there and rotate this thing around them. Probably gave them an eye mask because they weren't too aware of what was going on. Looks a bit macabre, that machine. And this is a brain. You kind of can see that's a brain. Kind of a cauliflower type thing. Um, taking up this radio tracer, shining nice and bright. And if you look on the left hand side, there's less blood flow on the left than there is on the right in this particular example. This is, you know, what we're using now um, with commercial systems. And it's actually made up of these things. Um, I'll pass this around so you can have a look because I know you'll appreciate it. Um, so we've, it's actually got scintillation crystal elements in here in lots and lots of tiny ones and it's backed by photomultiplier tubes. Um, so we have the light being generated in the crystal being funneled down towards the PM tubes that convert the light into electricity into a measurable current. And the grid of PM tubes can map um, exactly where the gamma ray came in. And so we can say, okay, within this tiny little square of a few millimeters by a few millimeters, and this is the detector array that I worked on for my PhD, um, this is, this we can say, you know, within a few millimetres where this hit this big detector ring. So let me pass that round. It's heavier than you think, and that's all in the crystal. So remember that number, 12,096. Um, this is the scanner I commissioned for Manchester Royal Infirmary. I loved it very much. <laughs> it's just been decommissioned, and it's a very sad day. Um, but they've upgraded, so I'm very happy for them. Anyone want to bet what, how many detector elements we've got in this? We had 12 in the one that I started with in sort of 2000. This was installed probably 2007. One and a half million. Oh, you're a bit generous there. Nearly, not, not quite that exciting. Any, but slightly lower, lower. Oh, I'm obviously, this number is obviously not impressive enough for you guys, is it? <laughs> I'm, in, I'm happy that I've basically got three, th th three times more detector elements within, you know, uh, five, said five, seven years um, with this detector. So it's about 20 centimetres long. And this scanner has actually got a CT scanner on the front so that you have this map of where your trace has gone, showing how active all these processes are in the body, um, which, what process you see depends on what trace that you give. And that you've got can map that directly onto the structure of the body because you can take a CT scan with the patient in exactly the same position. So most hospitals now will have a combined PET CT system. So the kind of big ring on the front is the CT scanner, so the sort of 3D X-ray image, and the back is the uh, PET 3D uh, radio tracer map um, at the back. Now I've given you the kind of short version. And I'm aware I'm going to have to hurry up because that already took the best part of half an hour. But just to skip through and just highlight a few of the challenges that we have um, with our systems. Um, obviously, the positron travels some distance before it meets the electron. And that means that this introduces a degree of positional uncertainty in the system that's dependent on the energy of the positron. So actually, depending on which radioisotope you choose, you can get a different spatial resolution which is weird 
But, but fortunately, fluorine has got quite a short positron range, so this is a minim minimal problem for most of our, st our studies. Also, positrons and electrons are completely stationary when they meet, so you have some re residual um, momentum that means that the gamma rays aren't quite back to back. And again, that introduces some positional uncertainty. And all that's dependent, how that follows through into the image is dependent on how you build your detector to start with and reconstruct the images. What I've told you about so far is true coincidences, back-to-back -back gamma rays. We can also have ones where one of the gamma rays is scattered and this dotted line is what we record and that's wrong. If we're working at very high radioactive concentrations, we can have two positrons meeting two electrons at the same time, which also needs to be corrected for. We also need to correct for the fact that some of the, the gamma rays don't make it out of the patient at all because they get either absorbed or scattered out of the detector. So there's all kinds of clever data corrections that need to be done. And these are all actually now built into the image reconst reconstruction loop. So actually, if you're looking for a computing challenge, medical image reconstruction is a field that's growing very, very, very quickly and can save a lot of radiation dose to patients and a lot of time in the clinic. One thing that's been particularly exciting over the last few years is that our detectors have got super, super fast. So in order to do this conventional detection that I've told you about, where you can say one gamma ray, the two gamma rays came from the same positron meeting the electron, you need a timing resolution of about four to six nanoseconds. So that's four to six thousandths of a millionth of a second. Our scanners are now down to less than half a nanosecond. So what we can say is that positron met the electron there with a certain degree of uncertainty. And that really improves the uh, accuracy with which we can pinpoint where the signal is coming from. It directly improves image contrast and quality and allows us to scan patients with low radiation dose and also a lot quicker. So this is our current standard. If you're going shopping, this is your, your menu of pets, current PET scanners. Um, ignore Philips the rubbish. Um, <laughs> is this being recorded? Um, but yeah, the whole pet community in the UK would agree with me, so I'm safe ground there. Um, for some reason, Philips have really taken the ball off the eye off the ball with PET scanners in the last five years. It's a real disappointment because at the moment it's a, basically a, a head to head between G and Siemens, and they're pretty close to be honest. Fast scintillation crystals, you can scan about 20 centimeters of the patient in one go. Really fast response. Um, and pretty good spatial resolution. CT is about half that, but there's only so good you can get with PET. For those of you, any image reconstruction nerds in the room? Okay, I'll move on. Um, <laughs> the next, um, the next, uh, next leap up from that is actually to use solid state detectors uh, rather than to use um, scint scintillation crystal and uh, uh, photomultiplier tube um, detectors, which are a lot quicker. Philips kicked this off, and again, I don't know what happened to them there. GE tried to match them, didn't quite manage it. Siemens played a blinder about 18 months ago and brought us down to 214 picoseconds. What that means in reality is we can see, tell with a Siemens system, which is what now that they've now got a Manchester own infirmary, where a positron met an electron within three centimetres. That's how good that system is. So we've got this system. We've got these lovely images of these sort of bright spots, and this is an example of a lung tumour, the, the white bit there. If you calibrate your PET scanner properly, and it's actually quite simple to do, you measure how much radioactivity you've got, kilobecquerels, kilobecquerels put it into a, an object with so many millilitres, hence kilobecquerels per mil. It's not a difficult, is it? Um, and you scan it, and you get a pix intensity of pixel values that you can then say that corresponds to so many kilobecquerels per mil. You've calibrated your scanner. Once you've done that, you can actually measure how much trace you've got in different bits of the body. And that's incredibly powerful because you can quantify how active all these processes are, how much of this trace is actually going through these different bits of the body. So just some, uh, some example images um, to finish off. Uh, this is the first scan we did of a patient with epilepsy at Manchester Royal Infirmary, and it turned out to be beautiful, which is always what you want on your first scan. The clinicians are going, show us the pictures, Heather, show us the pictures. And da da um, So this is a brain. It looks a bit better than one I showed you in the previous picture, doesn't it? And it's, kind of, we, it's a colour scale that goes from purple with not very good um, uptake of the traces through to bluey green and then yellow and red and then into white for lots and lots of uptake. 
So lots of this glucose is going to the outside of the brain, which is the most metabolically active bit of the brain. And in epilepsy, when you have an ep epileptic fit, you get loads and loads of glucose in that really active area. But in between fits, which is when we scan because that's when the patient stays still, um, we, we can see an actually lower glucose uptake in the same area. So we're looking for lower than normal. Can anyone spot it comparing right to left? Are there any bits that you think are actually a bit lower on one side than the other? How about there? Yeah? So this is your temporal lobe, and actually epilepsy, epilepsy of the temporal lobe is fairly common. If you're going to have epilepsy, it tends to affect that bit of the brain. So we were able to say, yes, it's this bit of the brain that's affecting this particular patient. The medication they were on work wasn't working. They actually had part of their temporal lobe surgically removed to uh, control their symptoms. Um, so yeah, he's doing a lot better because we were able to say, take this bit of the brain out and it'll help. Um, some heart scans. Um, because we've got a detector that's all around the patient all the time, we can take pictures of uh, this radio trace of distributions. It's changing. So we can take, you know, you can inject someone and see where it goes. So in this example, you've got the blood that comes into the heart in the middle and it distributes out into the heart muscle. We're looking at the delivery of blood to the heart muscle, which is often a problem that underpins a lot of heart conditions. And we can get diagrams that look a lot like this. So we can look at the heart under stress conditions, heart under rest conditions, and see how well the blood flow is, is ramped up in stress conditions to compensate. And because we know what's going in to this system, we can create a fairly simple model of how that distribution is happening. So there's the blood concentration, and that will go in and out of the myocardium, the heart muscle. We've got that variation in time. We've got the variation of this in time from all these different bits. And then we can build up a model of exactly how much um, of this of, of blood flow is going into the heart muscle in terms of mils per gram per minute. Why is this important? Well, believe it or not, this is a, a heart scan. So left, we see mainly the left ventricle because it's the big, biggest, chunkiest muscle in the, in the heart. Um, you can just about see the right ventricle on the side there, that shadow. And if you cut, it's kind of a cup shape, it pumps up like that. So if you cut through it that way, you get a series of donut shapes. If you cut through it that way or that way in your images, not for real, fortunately, you can do all this without taking the heart out, it's great. Um, so you get U shapes if you go that way. And that looks fairly even, fairly normal uptake of our radio trace. You would think that was good. And it is. These numbers show that the blood flow under stress conditions is ramping up exactly as it should. There's enough getting through. This one looks similarly good. But the numbers tell us it's not uniformly good. It's uniformly bad. The blood flow is not ramping up to the same extent under stress conditions. And the reason for this, if we do a more detailed CT, is there are blockages in all three of the arteries feeding the cardiac muscle. So this means that delivery of the uh, blood throughout the heart is hampered to the same degree all over the heart. And you would miss that if you didn't have the numbers. That's one of the powers of doing PET scanning and going to the effort of getting these numbers out of the scans. This is what I'm working on at the moment at the Christie. Um, we are using PET to not only look at how uh, uh, cancer, uh, how extensive cancer is, how aggressive it is, and also how it responds to treatment, but we're also able to image the delivery of the treatment because some of the treatments we use are radioactive as well and they give off some positrons. So just to show you some example images, this is quite a big chunky tumour in the liver. You can see that on our baseline scan shows it's quite extensive. We've got the PET in overlaid in kind of a reddy colour scale over the CT that's grey there. Fortunately, our therapy seems to have worked because it's a lot smaller on the follow-up scan. Um, and these are just different ways of imaging the same thing with different technology. I won't touch on those. But this is a, an image of the actual distribution of the therapeutic agent we've given. So this is yttrium-90 which gives off a little bit of positrons. So whilst we get a crummy PET image, we can actually see uh, where it's going. So one of the projects I'm working on at the moment is to say we've got all this data on the same patient. If we know that this therapeutic dose has been delivered to there, can we predict what that scan is going to look like? Um, so that's one of the things I'm working, at, working on at the moment. Getting numbers out of this is a nightmare, by the way. Um, that's why what's holding me up. 
So what's next? That's what we're doing now. Uh, what's next? You can go large. Bigger is better. Let's have a massive PET scanner. So the Americans build something large. Got to be the Americans, hasn't it? Um, so they've got they've got this absolutely massive um, PET scanner that they're building um, in in the US, and it, I, I've nicknamed it Coffin PET because it literally covers the patient from there to there. So if you think we've got claustrophobia issues in our current scanner, I have no idea how our patients are going to hold up in this. But it's really, really quick, and you can image the whole of the body in, in real time. So if you've got disease that's affecting the whole of the body, you can model how that is um, taking up tracer. You can model how various bits of the body are behaving differently to others. As a research tool, it's incredibly powerful. And the gossip is that Edinburgh are already trying to get the money for one. Um, £10 million, if anyone's got deep pockets. Um, the other thing which I'm particularly interested in with being at the Christie, we've just done proton beam in the last therapy in the last year, is that when you fire protons or carbon ions for therapeutic purposes at a patient, you actually create positrons inside the patient. So we, if we could if put a PET scan on the back of our proton beam therapy machine, we could image how successfully we've delivered that therapy before they even get off the table, because we can image where the positrons have been created. So I'm hoping, hoping that they'll get me to play with proton beam therapy at some point and put one of those on the back. The other thing is that um, we're getting huge quantities of data out of our PET scanner. So if we could, we need a clever way of processing that huge volume of data. You probably hear a, a story every week about how radiologists are going to be replaced by computers. Um, you have to train that software as carefully as we would a junior doctor. And that is the stumbling block at the moment. That's why it's not good enough to trust it yet. Um, it works in the situation where it's been trained. It can't be generalised to other centres. But there are ways forward where we could perhaps use um, AI techniques to pick up subtle details that perhaps we would have missed, a clinician would have missed. So they act as a second reporter, another pair of eyes on what we're already doing. So And it allows us to pick up subtleties on poorer quality images, which is what this paper is about. Um, both of those are open access if you want to go and have a look. So that's me. Hopefully, uh, you know a little bit more about why we inject people with radioactive stuff now. As I mentioned, I'm a wearer of many hats, um, but if you, I think we might have time for one question. One more question, quick. Um, but do find me on Twitter and ask me questions about answer matter anytime you like. Thanks very much. <laughs>